you're very welcome to this episode of Dark Vanishings. I hope you're keeping well wherever you are in the world. Today's case, the case of Peter Bergman, is one of the world's most mysterious John Doe cases. It has additional interest for me because it's based in Ireland uh, and I'm Irish. But let's get started. On the 16th of June in 2009, a man in his 60s was found washed up and dead on Ross's Point Beach in Sligo, a popular tourist recreational and fishing area. A small pile of clothes would later be retrieved on the beach that belonged to the man. To add to the mystery, the tags of some of this clothing had been crudely cut off. There was also no form of ID in the clothing. A father and son, Arthur and Brian Kinsler, found the deceased man on the beach. Arthur said that when he touched the washed up man's ankle, it was marble cold to the touch. They contacted the Gardaí, which is Irish for police, and while they waited for the Gardaí to arrive, they decided to say a prayer over the deceased man's lifeless body, a tender and beautiful gesture by Arthur and Brian. The Gardaí then began the process of attempting to unravel the dead man's identity. Little did they realise at that point the significance of this case, that it would go on to become one of the world's most baffling John Doe cases. In this video, I'd like to put forward some theories as to what I believe was Peter Bergman's story here in Ireland. So let's move forward. Sligo Town is situated in the northwest of Ireland, about 135 miles from Dublin and about 40 miles from the Northern Ireland border, which may have significance in terms of Peter Bergman's story, which I'll discuss later. Sligo has 20,000 inhabitants and is a popular tourist destination due to its proximity to the coast and its wild and rugged countryside in which the Benbalbum and Loch Norea mountains are also located. Sligo is also famous for its association with the poet William Butler Yeats, who spent many childhood summers there. William won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1923. So let's look at the timeline of Peter's story. Peter was first picked up on CCTV footage on the 12th of June, mid to late afternoon at Ulster Bus Depot in Derry. He originally boarded a bus headed for Galway and he did this in error, but after a chat with the bus driver, the bus driver pointed him in the right direction, which was a bus headed to Sligo Town. So we know from this that Peter's intended destination was Sligo Town. Peter was tall, about five foot ten, dressed in almost business-like attire, a lot of black uh, with shoulder luggage, hand luggage. He gave off the appearance of a man that was confident, there was no hesitancy, a man that was probably used to travelling in his lifetime. Later that day at 6.30pm, Peter checked into the Sligo City Hotel. He was clean shaven, organised, polite, and he spoke with a German accent. He spelled Bergman with a double N, as is the more common spelling of the surname in Austria. He also gave a fake address. Uh, the address he gave was for Austria also, and it turned out to be a vacant lot. Police determined, or the Gardaí determined, should I say, that Peter Bergman was also a fake name. They checked with the ports, with the airports, etc., and no record of a Peter Bergman could be found. Facial recognition systems also revealed nothing. They thought that perhaps a weak point in terms of you know, recognising Peter might have been as a ferry passenger, uh, a walk-on ferry passenger as opposed to a drive-on, that perhaps he sort of was able to keep a, a lower profile uh, as he travelled. One of the most startling discoveries that the Gardaí made is that during the course of his stay, Peter checked in on the 12th and he checked out on the 15th. He made 15 trips around the town of Sligo uh, with this purple carrier bag in which they believe he had personal artefacts, some of which linked to his identity. And what they discovered he was doing or had been doing was actually putting these items into bins around the town. But he did this out of the line of CCTV uh, footage. Uh, and so therefore these items, you know, 
they, they just disappeared into the ether. They were never recovered. But what was clear is that Peter was going to great pains, not only to conceal his identity, but to ensure that it was never discovered after his death. The autopsy would reveal that Peter Bergman was in fact a very sick man. He had advanced prostate cancer that was metastatic and it had metastasized to his bones. The coroner estimated that Peter had just a couple of weeks to live and that he most likely was aware of this. Uh, he was extremely thin. He would have been in a lot of pain. Mysteriously, the coroner noticed that there was no medication in his system, even for pain or, or even linked to the cancer. Um, and this, coupled with the fact that he had been attempting to dispose of his identity, uh, would suggest that Peter was winding down. He was preparing for death. He came to Sligo to die. Uh, whilst he was staying in the hotel, he also went to the local post office and he purchased 10 stamps. Who was Peter writing to? And again, this also adds to the mystery of Peter Bergman's death. Peter was a very contradictory person. On the one hand, he was so focused, so planned about his uh, death. We can see that, you know, he could pull off this incredible death in which his identity has never been discovered to this day. But on the other hand, we can tell from his autopsy and his heavy smoking habit that he was not someone who prioritised his own health. This might suggest that he was quite a selfless person. Perhaps he was married with a large family or perhaps had married a second time and had young dependents. Perhaps he put everything into his family life. Uh, and hadn't prioritised his own health, or it could be the opposite. Perhaps he's somebody who just, you know, he worked hard, played hard, and just, you know, health was something that just wasn't on any of his, you know, priority lists. I did wonder, could he have been in a stressful occupation? Um, people who have very high stress jobs can sometimes be neglectful about their own health. And I actually looked up the most stressful occupations. This is a really good list from careeraddict.com and it lists the 30 most stressful occupations. Now, I didn't list them all, um, you know, in the interest of brevity, but you can see that there are jobs listed there that just based on Peter's behaviour, I could see him in, you know, enlisted military police officer, healthcare worker. We do know that doctors and nurses, sometimes they're so busy caring for others, they don't get to prioritise their own health. Firefighter, airline pilot, phlebotomist, the person that takes your blood, you know, etc. in the hospital, air traffic controller. I, I could actually see Peter in those types of roles. This continued again, you can see this financial analyst, hospitality, chef, train driver, aircraft maintenance engineer, truck driver, teacher, social worker, IT manager, bartender, surgeon, taxi driver. Again, I could see him in any of these roles. At times he did remind me in his appearance of maybe an English teacher or a science teacher or a lecturer, maybe someone in IT. Uh, the bartender is an interesting one. He, at times he sort of reminded me of a publican with the dark clothes. You know, the black is sometimes sort of the unofficial colour of sort of the hospitality industry. There's a lot of black uh, trousers, etc. So I did wonder about that, but I think any of them are a possibility. Another possibility is that he could have been self-employed, which is, you know, stressful if you're running your own business. At times he did also remind me of somebody who could be in sales, you know, travelling around but I, I have a suspicion he may have had a stressful occupation. On the 15th of June, Peter checked out of the Sligo City Hotel and he took a bus to Ross's Point Beach. This confused a lot of people. They were thinking, you know, it's your last day on earth. You're about to take this very drastic course of action. Why wouldn't you get a taxi and make things a little bit more comfortable for yourself? I think that this was all part of his attempt to be sort of anonymous, not engage in conversations, to be forgettable. He also disposed of some of his baggage. He had a bite to eat in the bus station. He appeared to take a piece of paper out of his pocket that looked like um, a checklist. Uh, here we see the methodical plant Peter again, and he, he appeared to be looking at something that was most likely a checklist. We do know that later that day, around midnight, Peter would undress, neatly fold his clothes, and that he would swim out into the cold, dark water. It must have been terrifying, and it must have been 
freezing and so lonely as well. It's very poignant to think of uh, Peter like that. The Guardi do believe that he was most likely planning on not being washed back onto the shore, that his body would go back out uh, into the wider, greater ocean, if you like, and not come back onto the seashore. But the coroner said that Peter actually had a heart attack and there was no signs of drowning. So Gardy think that he didn't get out quite as far enough as he would have liked. He had this heart attack and it actually washed him back onto the shore. So I'd like to look at four theories that might explain uh, why Peter took the course of action that he did. And I'll be interested to see which theory you think is the most likely. So I'm going to start off with some of the darker possibilities first. Was Peter involved in criminal activity in his life or just immediately prior to his death? I mentioned earlier that Sligo is just 40 miles from Northern Ireland. Is it possible that Peter came to Ireland thinking that he could somehow disappear after death uh, and avoid being posthumously connected to some sort of crime that he did in his youth uh, or even, you know, later in life? Um, and you can see here in the journal.ie it talks about how many criminals are fleeing to Ireland. Perhaps there's a perception in Ireland that we're a little bit more laid back. For example, Peter wasn't asked for ID in the hotel that he could just disappear and avoid detection for some crime, you know, uh, that he had done when he was younger. Perhaps he felt that his DNA could be connected if he was, you know, exhumed, his DNA could be connected to a rape or a murder. And this was why he was anxious to have his body float out to sea. Perhaps he was some sort of DNA fugitive, if you like, you could put it like that. Um, I don't know that this is the most likely. He seemed so sort of responsible and so organised and diligent in the CCTV footage. He doesn't strike me as the type, but it's certainly something to consider. As I mentioned, uh, there can be a perception that Ireland is an easy place for a criminal to hide out in. And here's a story in the Irish Examiner, one of our newspapers, uh, which looks at a serial rapist who had actually been hiding out in the Irish Midlands. Um, so, you know, this is not uh, uncommon. And again, it was just something to, to consider. Another possibility to consider is that it is clear that Peter did not want to be buried. Um, and again, is this linked to criminality? You know, many criminals can have their headstones, you know, vandalised or desecrated. Had he done something you know, that was linked to a sex crime or a hate crime. And he was concerned about this. It might have been something he did in his youth, but he was concerned that it would come back to haunt him and his family. Again, I don't think this is likely, but it's just something to consider. I mentioned earlier that Peter wore a lot of black and at one point I wondered, could he have been, you know, a priest? Maybe these were just his casual clothes and, and hence a lot of black. And it's interesting because you can see here, I did a Google search and there are many priests who've gone missing. There's one here, computer sees from a priest in sex abuse cases missing. Another one, priest accused of sexual abuse in Dallas has gone missing. Could he have been a priest? Did he do something, you know, like this during his life and he didn't want to be exhumed and linked in any way to some sort of crime? I think that this isn't likely at all. I, I just uh, included it because I, I found the amount of black that he wore uh, so fascinating and I wondered, did it have any significance? But it's just it's just a possibility that I that I that I'm throwing out there. A criminal reason for uh, the way in which Peter ended his life that is very plausible could relate to insurance fraud. And you can see here on Investopedia, there's information on no medical exam life insurance policies. These are life insurance policies that you can take out, but you're not requested to undergo a medical examination. And this could have been very appealing to somebody like Peter who had such poor health. Is it possible that because he didn't keep on top of his health, he unexpectedly got this terminal diagnosis in relation to cancer? Perhaps he had a lot of dependents. It could have been brothers or sisters or, um, you know, children, etc., or spouses. And, you know, perhaps he'd had a second marriage or was still, you know, in a first marriage or just had a partner whatever the case may be. And he wasn't sufficiently prepared financially to secure their future. So he engaged in this fraud. Uh, 
An autopsy can be requested in this type of policy. So therefore, it would have been in incredibly important that Peter not wash back onto the shore. Um, and the irony is he did end up having an autopsy, but his goal was obviously to avoid the autopsy. Um, you know, if this was one of the motivations for, you know, the way in which he died. So I think that this is a possibility because his family could say after a period of six to seven years, you know, that their loved one is missing, he's never returned and he will be declared dead and they can actually claim the insurance. Perhaps he was self-employed and had left lots of debts or we, we just don't know. But but there's certainly a possibility here, I think. So the next theory that I would like to look at is, did Peter have some sort of mental health issue? I mentioned earlier a mild condition called white coat syndrome. It happens when you go to the doctor and you're nervous and you actually get raised blood pressure. But there is also iatrophobia, which is a more extensive fear of matters relating to doctors, hospitals, medical tests, checkups, health in general. And this type of person will avoid anything to do with health. I did wonder because of the poor state of Peter's health, if he had some sort of, you know, fear like this. And uh, obviously he was now terminally ill with very advanced cancer, perhaps family members or the medical health services wanted him to go to a hospice, etc. And this was something that would have been very uncomfortable for him. So he decided to get away to a country where he could use an alternative identity and just die in the manner uh, that suited him. Something else that he thought of because he was so anxious for his body to wash out to sea was, did he have a fear of being buried? It's a very common phobia called taphobia, which is a fear of being buried alive. But I personally feel he wouldn't have had to come to Ireland to avoid being buried at all. You know, he could have done that in his own country. I think the fact that he travelled to Ireland meant that he was either running from some sort of crime, it could have even been quite a petty crime, or he was running from either the health services or family members who wanted him maybe, you know, to get proper uh, palliative care. And this is just something he just, he didn't want to have. Something else that we have to consider is that he could have had some kind of personality disorder or psychiatric condition in which he imagined he was being pursued or followed. This isn't as uncommon as you think. Some patients with schizophrenia, for example, who have this delusion will tell you that they're being watched by the FBI and, you know, they're being followed, etc. This kind of delusion is common with schizophrenia, but it is also present in conditions like Alzheimer's disease, dementia, epilepsy, obsessive compulsive disorder. I was interested to see obsessive compulsive disorder there because uh, Peter was so, you know, neat and fastidious and planned, etc. But it's just, it's something to consider very interesting from Daily Caring. It looks at the four top dementia accusations, stealing, poisoning and being held prisoner. We know that Robin Williams, uh, who had a neurological condition, was imagining that he was being stolen from. Uh, could Peter have had some sort of early onset dementia, etc., thinking, you know, people were trying to take his money or, you know, force him into an institution or, you know, etc., that he was being sort of taken over. I think that this is the least likely, but it's it's just something to consider that perhaps there was some kind of psychological or psychiatric condition. Looking at the CCTV footage, he looks so in charge and so relaxed. It, it's hard to see that, but I, I'm just putting it out there. So theory number three relates to estrangement. Was Peter a very independent man his whole life? He could possibly have even been a bachelor. He lived life on his own terms. Perhaps he kept a distance from family. And now that he was ill, these people were coming into his life and taking over. And he just wanted to reclaim his independence far away um, you know, from these family members and by going to Ireland, he felt he could, you know, assume a different identity and that they would never track him down and bring him back. There is the well-known John Doe case of Lyle Stevick, who checked into a hotel, committed suicide in the hotel by hanging himself. 
Uh, his identity wasn't discovered for many, many years. And when it was, it was discovered that he had been estranged from family. So again, it's just something to consider. Um, I personally feel that if there is a reason for Peter coming to Sligo to die, it, it's maybe related to some sort of insurance fraud or, um, you know, estrangement from family or just wanting not even full-blown estrangement but wanting to take charge of his own death and, and be independent in that respect. Something else to consider in terms of family dynamics is was Peter a victim of adult or elder abuse as he became vulnerable in terms of his health were children or a spouse uh, taking him over or arguing about an inheritance etc so that is certainly something to think about and it would be a strong motivation for Peter wishing to uh, escape and to go somewhere where he would uh, avoid detection uh, by them. Perhaps in the end there isn't a very sinister reason for Peter Bergman's a trip to Ireland to end his life for concealing his identity. Perhaps he had loved ones, but he had lost control of how he wanted to leave this world. And he felt he had no alternative than to assume a false identity, go to another country where loved ones couldn't bring him back and execute his death in the manner that he wanted to. Perhaps he wanted to have one last adventure. This is a very interesting story in the Washington Post about two elderly men who ran away from a nursing home and went to the world's biggest heavy metal festival. Perhaps Peter wanted to have one last trip. Maybe he was a man who enjoyed traveling and he didn't want to go into a hospice and he wanted to go out on his own terms. We have to remember that in Germany, if Peter was indeed from Germany, there has been a cultural shift in relation to funerals and there is an increase in what's called the forest funeral where loved ones are actually being remembered uh, through a tree. You, it's got a kind of an eco element to a tree is purchased. The idea is, you know, that you're growing the forest area, uh, your loved one is cremated and they're sort of permanently remembered in this more environmentally friendly way. So there is a culture shift and perhaps Peter was somebody who sort of subscribed to that philosophy that he wasn't particularly precious about being buried in the traditional way. He was happy to swim out into the ocean and return to nature. Uh, funerals are very expensive. They cost uh, 8,000 uh, pounds in Germany and perhaps he, was, he didn't have the money uh, for the funeral, perhaps his finances weren't in order, you know, perhaps he didn't want to burden someone with that expense. So there could be that aspect as well. If you're interested in the Peter Bergman case, I highly recommend that you check out The Last Days of Peter Bergman. It's a film that has been made by uh, the award winning Irish film director, Kieran Cassidy. It is so beautifully made and it has fascinating insights from, you know, people uh, who saw Peter around the town on, on those few days and on the beach. And it's just a really, really stunning piece of filmmaking. It's available on YouTube. I've included the link there. There is also a brilliant podcast on um, Spotify. Uh, Rosita Boland, who is a journalist with the Irish Times, she has written extensively about Peter Bergman and she produced a really moving and eloquent podcast about him. And uh, check it out. It's just a uh, Again, a stunning, stunning production. Rosita Boland put forward the theory that perhaps uh, Peter had some sort of connection to Sligo from an intellectual point of view. He liked the work of William Butler Yeats or just liked Sligo as, as a part of the world that he thought was very beautiful. An interesting thing about the work of William Butler Yeats is that it does feature a lot of water, lakes, etc. Um, in relation to Sligo. This is one poem that I came across. It's called Two Old Men Admiring Themselves in the Water. It says, I heard the old, old men say, everything alters and one by one we drop away. They had hands like claws and their knees were twisted like old thorn trees by the water. I heard the old, old men say, all that's beautiful drifts away like the waters. And you just immediately think of Peter drifting away 
in the ocean by Ross's Point Beach. It's hard to know whether this did have an influence on him, but certainly Sligo is so synonymous with William Butler Yeats. It's a possibility. You just never know. It's a very romantic view of his uh, visit to Sligo and of his death. It would be the most beautiful and, uh, you know, the most profound uh, reason for his visit. But but I guess we just don't know. In the end, I do think that Peter Bergman was running from something. Perhaps it was the health services. Maybe he was a bachelor and they were being forceful about him, you know, entering a hospice or getting palliative care. Perhaps he just didn't like the medical services or, you know, he he just it wasn't his thing. He liked to be independent and free. Perhaps, you know, he had a family. Again, he was a bachelor, but his family was starting to take him over. Or perhaps he did have a partner and children who were also taking control of the situation and he wanted to wrestle back control. There could also be a criminal motivation in coming to Sligo to die. We can't, of course, entirely rule that out. Um, you know, but whatever the reason, one thing is for certain, Peter did go out on his own terms and the photograph taken of him after death shows a very peaceful man. So what do you think were Peter's motivations for coming to Sligo to die? I'll be really curious to see your comments. Thanks so much for watching. It really means a lot. Every like, subscription, comment uh, just thrills me to pieces. Thank you also to all my existing subscribers. Um, I'm really appreciative. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Do take care and all the best. Thank you.